So uh, thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Leslie Shu. Uh, I'm a fantasy book author and I live near Baltimore in the United States. Today, I would like to share a selection of stereo photos from my trips to Nepal in 1998 and India in 2001, uh, kind of a long time ago. Um, before uh, I share the photos, I'd like to talk about the camera I used. I think some of you may be familiar with this kind of camera. Uh, a friend of mine let me borrow his Nimslo 3D quadrilens camera for both of these trips. Uh, the Nimslo was made in the 1980s. Um, it takes four photos instead of two photos at the same time. And the idea is that you would send it off to a lab and they would turn each set of photos into a lenticular print. Um, but you can also make stereo slides. So for uh, these photos, I use Fujichrome Velvia 35 millimeter slide film. And each set of four photos takes up uh, the space of two 35 millimeter slides on a roll of film. So for a 36 exposure roll, you would get uh, 18 photo sets. And after I returned to America, I got the film developed. My friend took the first and fourth photos of each set, and we just discarded the ones in the middle and took the first and fourth. And uh, he mounted them on these half frame stereo slide mounts. And the bottom image is against a light table, so you can better see the aspect ratio of each frame. So I had this wonderful collection of stereo slides that could only be seen with a stereo slide viewer. Um, they sat in boxes on my bookshelf for over 20 years. Um, but earlier this year, I finally purchased a transparency scanner, and it's the Epson Perfection V600 photo scanner. Uh, it took me about three weeks to scan and format each slide pair. I used the rubber stamp tool in Photoshop to remove specks of dust and debris from the left and right photos. Um, there were a lot of specks, some were on the slides themselves, some were in the photos from the camera lenses that if I forgot to clean the camera, like way back then. Um, and if you can imagine, like any speck of dust on the left or right is going to pop out and start flickering if you view it in 3D. So that was the most time consuming part of the project was uh, removing all the little imperfections on the photos. Uh, then I used a free stereo, uh, free program called Stereo, Stereo Photo Maker to align and create the stereo pairs. In June, I began posting the stereo photos on Instagram and X, uh, one per day. And uh, I provided the cross view and parallel formats. And I posted the final photo in October. So for today, I picked out some favorites, and we're going to start with Nepal. In 1998, I traveled to Kathmandu in Nepal and with two of my American friends. Uh, for the first week, I stayed in a hotel with my friends, and we explored different parts of the city. This is an outdoor market in uh, Durbar, Durbar Square in Patan, and I may mispronounce like place names and people names sometimes. I apologize. Um, uh, so here is another uh, thing I saw in Kathmandu. These gentlemen were playing a game of some sort on the surface of the board. And um, I just really like this photo. It's kind of a snapshot in time. I mean, uh, the baby would be in his 20s probably by now. So, um, so these gentlemen were watching a goat sacrifice. Uh, the goat is not pictured here. Um, I, I like this photo because it gives a sense of the density of the buildings in the historic areas of Kathmandu. Um, so it's actually one of my favorite photos. I have a lot of favorite photos. Um, so this uh, is ascending the steps to Swayambhanath Stupa, which is a site that is revered by both Buddhists and Hindus. Uh, there are a lot of steps, um, but a lot of people come to visit those sites. So. Um, this is a picture of the very top of Swayambhanath Stupa. It's a structure, a stupa has a, is like a dome which contains religious relics. And on top is a cube structure and it has the eyes of the Buddha looking in all four directions. So here's another picture of the very top of it. I did not get a good photo of the whole stupa because there's a lot of buildings around it and stuff. Um, but it, it was a pretty neat place to visit. So. I uh, enjoyed taking street scenes in Kathmandu, like photos of street scenes. These vendors are selling buffalo meat. Um, the locals called it buff for short. 
Um, so, uh, and please tell me if I'm going too fast or too slow or anything. Um, so this is one of my very favorite photos. These vendors are selling vegetables from these large baskets on the back of their bicycles. And I believe this was in the evening. Um, so I really like the lighting. The Nimslow didn't do that well in like low lighting situations. So the best photos seem to happen in like pure daylight without clouds or in like an evening or morning setting. Uh, here's another famous stupa in Kathmandu. It's called Bodhanath stupa. I spent a lot of time here, which I'll explain shortly. So the Dome of Bodhanath, or Bodhanath sits atop this cascade of wide concrete tiers. And on this day, there was a Nepali festival and throngs of people were covering every tier of the stupa. And it was very crowded and it, it was pretty neat to see. And here's a photo from the top of the stupa on a quieter day. I'm like on the topmost tier of Bodhanath stupa. So you can see the whole stupa is surrounded. It's a huge complex that's surrounded by shops. And uh, in the background, you can see the Himalaya mountains. And uh, for some reason, this is one of my favorite photos as well. It's just a quiet moment. Some elder Tibetans had gathered in the morning uh, near the base of the stupa. They were um, there for some ritual of some sort, but I like this photo, so I added it. So after that first week that I was there, my American friends went off to hike in the Himalayas, and I had arranged to stay in Kathmandu. Uh, I had the opportunity to live with a Tibetan family for three weeks, and here are my hosts. They're, named, they're a young married couple named Sopa and Pimba, and they live near Bodhanath Stupa uh, with their extended family. And Sopa was a Tonka painter. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, I was able to visit his studio, which was really amazing. Tonkas are traditional paintings that depict, uh, depict Tibetan Buddhist deities and iconography that uh, are based on Buddhist scriptures. Uh, one night there was a long life puja for His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, and thousands of Tibetans took part at Bodhanath Stupa. Uh, so you can see that the Nimslo had a detachable flash, which I used with uh, various varying degrees of success. <laughs> um, but I, I like, I just, I guess photos as well. Uh, with Sopa and Pima's family, I had the opportunity to attend religious ceremonies at two different Tibetan monasteries uh, in the Kathmandu area. So I took this photo at Kaning Shevdrup Ling Monastery the Lama performing the blessings was named Chokling Rinpoche. And here's a little bit of a better photo of him. Uh, he was the, he's the brother of another well-known teacher named Choki Nima Rinpoche. <laughs> and I just wanted to point out that the woman in the foreground has a ballpoint pen holding her bun in place, which I used to do when I had long hair as well. Um, but that was kind of a nice find when I came back and uh, develop the photos, you know, you see little details like that. So. Uh, this is the same event. Uh, you can see Pimba in the blue shirt in the foreground, and her husband Sopa is in the brown jacket uh, behind, in the row behind, and they're waiting for the blessings, and their parents and grandparents are with them. And uh, I like the little kid there. He's kind of cute. So I wanted to show you one more busy street in Kathmandu. It's one of my favorite photos as well. I'll give you a moment to take all that, that in. Uh, the sidewalks were pretty busy at times. So, And then the next photo is a bit of a contrast. Um, it's a not so busy street. <laughs> um, so I stayed by myself overnight in a rural area outside of Kathmandu. It's called, uh, the towns are called Parping and Dakshankali. They're really close together. And the area has several caves where that are sacred to Buddhists and several sites and temples that are uh, sacred to Hindus. Um, and there are quite a few Tibetan Buddhist monasteries around there. So you see, you would see monks walking down the road and stuff. And this is just uh, some school's children I saw walking on the road. 
And there were a lot of terraced fields and farmland, like up in the hills in that area. Uh, this is the girl that we saw before. So when I first walked up and I saw this flat orange expanse, I thought it was a paved lot of some kind, but it's actually water. It's a pond. It's perfectly smooth and covered with orange algae. So I had to get close to like see a ripple in the water and understand what that was. Um, but I, it was just an interesting thing I hadn't really seen before. Uh, at one point I climbed up a hill and I saw these two tiny kids. I don't remember where they came from or where they seemed to be going, um, but I took a photo. So I like this photo. Um, so further along on top of that hill, I sat down on a boulder to rest and this monk, this very friendly monk just showed up out of nowhere. And uh, he knew like maybe 10 words of English and I knew 10 words of Tibetan, but you know, we had a conversation nonetheless. And it, it was really neat. Um, he took a picture of me, which is in the main collection that I posted online. Um, and this is the last photo I have from my Nepal trip. Next, I like to share my Nimzlo photos from the trip I took a few years later in India. In December 2001, I traveled to a Tibetan settlement in Moongad, India, which is in Karnataka state in southern India. I stayed there for two weeks to attend a series of initiations and teachings given by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. So before I get to that, I just wanted to share one of my favorite photos on the way to Moon God. I took this one in a town called Hubli. It was called Hubli, and then since then they've actually changed the name of some of the towns, and now it's called Hubali, I think, or something like that. So once I got to Moon God, I stayed at this guest house called Sawa House. I was with a group uh, from America and Taiwan, and my roommate was a wonderful woman named Susan. And the main purpose of the event was for His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to visit and consecrate a new prayer hall at Gadan Jinkste Monastery. And we could see the monastery right across the way from our room at Sawa House. So it's back there in the background with the golden roofs and stuff. The Tibetan settlement of Moon God has several monasteries and at least one nunnery. Um, thousands of monks and lay people came to the ceremonies and the teachings each day. Uh, not to mention all the foreign visitors who traveled there. This is another picture of the same uh, queue, the same line with some people in the foreground. I don't have any pictures of His Holiness. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, they would not allow us to take cameras into the prayer hall. I was lucky to be with a group who was allowed to sit along the wall inside the prayer hall, and then the rest of the prayer hall was filled with monks. And then those who can fit inside were sitting in the courtyard. There was just tens of thousands of people there. And uh, we had like two sessions a day of the teachings and things like that. So we had several opportunities to visit other areas in the settlement. Uh, to get from one place to another, we would pile into a Jeep. And um, it was very dusty, so people would often wear bandanas over their nose. I think I had to do that a couple of times myself. And here's a view, my view from the back of a Jeep while on the road between the villages. Um, as you can see, people would cling to the site. You know, they really packed people into these Jeeps. And uh, I just really liked the monk who's sitting <laughs> on top. And here's another view inside with a young monk who is hanging on to the side of the Jeep. And the Jeeps don't go very fast, if I remember, because they've got a lot of people on them. Uh, here's my roommate, Susan, and a monk named Tenzin Kalsing. He was friends with people in our group. Uh, he helped translate. Um, he, he knew English really well. And here we're trying to take a shortcut through the fields, which actually turned out to be a considerable hike. <laughs> uh, we visited Jiangshou Choling Nunnery several times. This is Gyaltsen, Tampa, and Tenzin Yangdun. I believe Susan was sponsoring one of these nuns, and they were able to meet each other in person for the first time. And we also had an opportunity to stay overnight there one night, which is pretty neat. 
Uh, we also visited Draping Lossling Monastery where Tenzin Kalsang lived. And here he is with Geshe Tukten Lekshe. Geshe is an academic degree that's awarded to those who study for many, many years and pass rigorous exams in Buddhist philosophy. So it's similar to a PhD. So this is a, another one of my favorite photos. I don't remember the name of the older monk, but the boy in the blue shirt is Tenzin Regshak. They were making momos, which are Tibetan dumplings. Uh, in this case, the momos were filled with some kind of potato mixture, maybe with some cauliflower. The monk in this photo is Tupten Norbu. Uh, some of my photos from the Nimzo were a bit blurry in the foreground. I don't think I realized until um, I got back home and saw the photos like that I couldn't really get that close to my subjects. So I actually had to discard some photos that were just too blurry, um, and we didn't even put them in the slide mounts. So here's Tupsen Norbu chopping vegetables. Um, I think one of the monks shared this little apartment with the older monk, but I don't remember which. Uh, this is in the courtyard of Drepung Lossli Monastery. You can see Tenzin Kelsang is in the middle, and the boy Tenzin Rigchuk is on the right. I don't remember why they were lighting candles. Um, I have several photos of this in the main collection. Um, but this is, I really like this photo. Um, so I have, I don't have, I'm, this is the last one I'm gonna share from the Tibetan settlement, but um, yeah, there's a bunch more on online that I'll share uh, how you can see those. Um, on the way home, I stayed overnight in Goa, which is a town on the Western coast of India. And I saw something that I had never seen before, which is a cow walking on a beach. This is, place was called Bogmalo Beach. It, my hotel was right on the beach. And it turns out there were other cows on the beach. And uh, for some reason, I always thought that there were people taking a nap on this blanket. But when I just this year formatted the photos and got kind of a closer look, um, I realized the cow is literally standing on the blanket. So. I don't think anyone is going to, maybe those are just belongings of someone and they went to the water or something because it looks like the cow is just going to walk right across it. Um, the Nimzo did not do very well in low lighting situations, like I mentioned, but I, I really like this photo for the memory of that moment. So just something I don't see in America very often. Um, I think at this point I was trying to use up my film because I took a bunch of sunset photos. Um, but this is the last night that I spent in India before flying home. Uh, so this, those are some of the highlights. Um, there are a bunch more in the main collection that I would have loved to show. Uh, if you would like to see the rest, you can visit stereo.photos.nepal.india on Instagram or 3D Nepal in India on X. Um, if you'd like to learn more about me and my other projects, you can visit leslieshu.com. Uh, I would also like to thank my friend, Mark Hempel, who let me borrow the Nimslo camera, and he also painstakingly mounted all of those stereo slides, which is not, not an easy task. So, uh, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free. Thank you very much. That was awesome. You're I welcome. Have a question. <laughs> sure. I have a question. Yep. Um, with the NIMSLA, you get four images. Do you uh, choose among them which makes the best stereo for any particular situation? Or did so... you always pick, pick two particular photo, pick two particular images? We always, we generally would take the first and the fourth because they were the furthest spread. Um, and then he had a film slicer and he would have to actually slice into, like for the first one, he would have to slice into the second one a little bit to have a little bit to um, attach to the mount. So um, the middle two would pretty much be destroyed, the third mm -hmm. and the second. However, there were a couple of cases where um, 
there would be a problem with the film and like the the image didn't quite go far enough or something, you know, the fourth one would be um, just corrupted in some way. So we did have maybe a couple that would have like the first and third, but I don't think you could do like one and two or two and three or three and four and get enough of a, you wouldn't have as much of the 3D effect. So it generally it was the first and the fourth. Could you find um, in the, the large crowds, was there a difference in, in the way the people were moving between one, two, three, and four? Uh, Or no, because it's pretty was, instantaneous. yeah, Like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not enough of a, of a, of a difference in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the um, baseline to, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I have to admit my friend uh, Mark was the one. He was pretty good about choosing like which ones to, and how to mount them and align them and everything. Uh, even when I scanned them this time, they, I ended up having to do some adjustments in the stereo photo maker. Like a, sometimes they were slightly off vertically. Um, but really that was the only thing I had to do other than removing all the dust and stuff. So I hope that answered your question. I have a question. Um, first off, uh, incredible uh, to see film give a realistic image. It's so, um, I'm, I'm used to digital. And um, the colors are so, those street shots, you really feel you are there. And also the exposure levels, um, it's, it's very natural exposure levels. I didn't feel like you had to do much post-production to, to make the contrast and the illuminance balance out. Were they pretty much straight shots? Uh, yeah, I, they were just straight shots. I, first of all, I'm an, still am an amateur photographer. Um, I didn't really see what I had until I got back to America because it's on film. Um, when I digitize them, when I scan them, uh, there's some photos where the shadows, there's structures that just don't show up. And I was kind of disappointed by that, actually. Um, you know, things that you would see with your eyes, like buildings in the shadow or the cow on the beach, you know, um, that didn't actually really show up well if you saw like it just kind of turns into a gray area. Um, so my feeling is that it actually did better in full daylight. Um, but again, I'm not like a real photographer, so I don't know how that works or why or, you know. Um, well, just as a possibility, like the uh, the cow on the beach, that um, you could do some post production on that and pull those shadows out. But um, but those street shots with the kids and things, um, you really felt that you were there. It was very, um, it was very um, guttural to feel that because I'm I'm used to digital and it was like, oh, this is film, and uh, you it was appreciated seeing that. So, and one other thought, uh, you said um, you didn't have, you didn't, some things were fuzzy and you couldn't use them. Um, there's, there's new, um, I, I discovered this out of desperation, but um, you can actually make um, a left or a right version and you can do a lot of post-production um, and save a lot of images that you thought, you know, 10 years ago were unusable. And, um, They're very, very effective now. The new, I use Topaz. I'm sure there's other companies, but um, it's it's kind of uh, amazing what can be done now to pull something and make something so it's uh, uh, you can you can you can uh, save imagery that you thought was unsavable. So, yeah, that's that's a good thing to know. I did in Photoshop. I did adjust the levels. on some of them, but I just wasn't able to save some of the shadow areas. Um, if it was one of those daylight shots, I didn't bother with the levels. That's pretty natural, but those ones on the beach or um, there's ones that are on the, in the main collection that I didn't show here that they're just areas that I tried to pull out a little bit, but it's very grainy um, because this film just was very grainy. Um, and it, the more I tried to pull out some of the um levels and adjust that the grain would show more so 
a grainier um, and grainier. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it was almost worse. So yeah. um, I had to kind of leave it alone. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Question. Are you are you still shooting any stereo either with the NIMSLOW or other uh, other cameras? So I um I don't have the NIMSLOW because that was my friend um and I don't own any stereo. I have been shooting because my interest is renewed. Um I have been shooting cha chas with my phone. Like I've got a couple of our pets and things like that that I was able to get, and I'm actually looking to research more and understand because I've seen I've met people now um, in the stereo community that just have amazing photos that um, the digital photos to me just look incredible. So I'm more interested now in maybe getting a, a phone or a camera and, and taking up the hobby again, for sure. Uh, right now, all I have is just, you know, take a picture here, take a picture here, use the software to <laughs> align them. But um, I'm hoping to learn more and get something better going with that. I think it's a good time because there are a number of different options available. So, uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, yeah, I, I, I would like, I need to take the time and even ask some of the community, you know, what they use and stuff. I just haven't had time to do that yet. Um, I would really like to take, to get some equipment where you can just take the shot and it's done and ready. And yeah, that'll be, that'll be awesome. <laughs> 